Thank you very much. I, I want to focus, uh, as I did in my intervention yesterday, on the question of uh, how to be effective in uh, what we want to do. Because I think the fundamental problem is a very sharp break between what is known and what is done. And we need to understand better uh, how to bridge that complex uh, chasm which exists. Let me just mention three things that have come up in our discussion uh, in the last hour. Maria's statement was alarming to me that uh, here we've been hearing expertise for the last two days about uh, the uh, heavy costs of air pollution on uh, non-communicable disease, and it's not even part of WHO policy, not part of international policy. But I just looked at the website, the NCD website of WHO, it doesn't even mention air pollution. Unbelievable. We will never make progress if that gap is not closed. So one recommendation from us should be to Dr. Tedros that this is absolutely unacceptable. You see, policymakers don't know almost anything. They are extreme generalists, generally poorly educated, and very busy. Then there are specialists who know everything. And the gap is crucial to close. Because the policymakers, if they don't have on their list the air pollution for non-communicable disease, we could talk for the next 20 years. It won't make any difference. So that's an absolute direct leverage point. That's one example. A second example is uh, the discussion we just had about food. Uh, Andy mentioned it uh, uh, and uh, Howard mentioned it. I don't think our problem, frankly, is the tradition of food. The problem is the wreckage of our food system from rapid change of McDonald's, Coca-Cola, sugar beverages, fast food, we're in the middle of an epidemic that is shocking. 40% of Americans are obese. This is not caused by your mom's uh, traditional diet. This is caused for what passes for food in the United States. It's hardly food. When other people come to the United States, they can't believe it's called food. The portions are one thing, but the garbage on the plate is another. Those are very powerful companies. They have packaged the food, stuffed it with sugar, stuffed it with saturated fats, stuffed it with salts, stuffed it with processed grains, and they're killing us. So that's another point, which is let's get our targets right because a tremendous amount of our problem is actual reasons for uh, our problem of vested interests, what uh, has been called structures of sin. And these are structures of sin. These companies know the damage. They have fleets of lawyers protecting them. They have massive lobbyists protecting them. We're fighting against real interests. And so this is a second point that I think is, is really important. And then I wanted to refer to uh, um, Erminia's uh, comment about uh, better education. Yes and no in one sense. The United States is 
so fundamentally messed up in letting the drug companies talk directly to the public. It's unbelievable. These drug companies market morning, noon, and night, and they sell garbage to us. And they sell procedures, drugs, over-medication, just like you said. In normal countries, it's not public education. It's stopping this industry. And the corruption of the industry is incredible because they've corrupted the doctors with kickbacks, with commissions, with paid speeches. And we have a remarkable story this week in The New Yorker, if uh, people get a chance to read it, about the opioid epidemic, which is a creation of the Sackler family. They own Purdue Pharma. That makes OxyContin. They have spent fortunes on doctors prescribing the opioids, pushing them out, lying about the uh, addictive tendencies. They're big philanthropists. They all have their halls at Harvard and at Columbia and uh, everywhere. And they're killing Americans in large numbers. So this is another structure of sin. So I think we, it's incredible how much knowledge there is and how little it impacts decisions. And that to my mind is the most important point which is knowledge based approaches so that we can actually use our reason and uh, logic and uh, evidence to actually accomplish something. And I wanted to give some suggestions on how that can be done. Oops. Bottom one. Thank you. Good. All right. Um, first, let's remember that Pope Francis asks us for a revolution. So a revolution's not easy, and we really need to be better mobilized than we are because we're not getting through. And we're not getting through for the reasons I've explained. The system isn't random. The system actually operates for lots of profits, lots of interests, lots of power structure, and uh, changing that system is not simple. Second, Pope Francis uh, notes in Laudato Si that interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan. That's really an important idea. And uh, especially in the United States, we hate the word plan partly because plan would mean a threat to lots of the nonsense that's going on. So in part, thanks to Pope Francis, we have the sustainable development goals. They're the closest thing we're going to come to one world with a common plan. But they don't mean much on their own. It's easy to be cynical about them. It's easy to bet against them. But what I would say to you is that they're the only chance that I can see, at least, for us to actually have coherent international action. It's very hard to get international agreements on anything. This negotiation took three full years. The Paris Climate Agreement basically took 25 years from the signing of the UN Framework Convention. Either we recognize their fragility and their importance, or we will have no tools to really intervene. Why are these goals important or potentially useful for us? 
because every country in the world is supposed to be doing something about it. And I can tell you that dozens of countries are. The United States, no. Nothing at the federal level, of course. With Trump, we're in a destruction mode. We're not in a constructive mode. But in countries all over the world, governments are actually trying to do something about this. I am coming from a workshop in Kuala Lumpur where we had senior planning ministry officials from Vietnam, Pakistan, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and one more that I'm missing. The Philippines, no. Okay, all seriously engaged in integrating the sustainable development goals into national policies. It's not just mechanical action, it's somebody does work and this is at least the work that's done and so this is the one point of intervention that one can have. And I visit probably about 75 countries, 60 countries a year, I would say. Uh, and almost all of them are doing, so. I'm there, you know, for a day usually or two because the governments are doing something about the sustainable development goals. So they're not empty words. They are uh, not decisive, but unique in that they are an entry point to actual policy. Policy is not the beginning and the end of this, I'm going to say in a moment, but policy is very important. And the key is to get your knowledge into policy. And if after all the years we can't get the air pollution into the non-communicable disease framework, we're not going to make it. So we have to push very hard to correct that and use the expertise of the knowledge community to do it. And by the way, if the knowledge community is deeply divided, it's hopeless to do that. Because again, politicians don't know anything. Believe me, their knowledge level of, because they're dealing with a thousand issues and they're not even trained. They're a local business person. They're someone who got into politics. They're, but they have no training. But they are actually passing laws or regulations or making appointments or sitting on regulatory boards. So bridging this knowledge gap, you find the entry points into policy. Health issues are pervasive in the sustainable development goals. So if you're interested in public health, you got it made. They're everywhere in the sustainable development goals. Not only SDG 3 on universal health, but all through the sustainable development goals. There are goals on nutrition uh, in SDG 2. SDG 3 is filled with insights, for instance, by 2030, substantially reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals and air, water, and soil pollution. Bingo. You've got your target there. The knowledge community should be hammering home on SDG 3.9. That is your leverage. Governments are supposed to be doing something about it. If they hear a united front that this is what to do, there's a chance actually to do something, subject to some of the other things I want to say, especially the, the vested interests. There's water and sanitation, SDG 6. There's indoor air pollution, SDG 7. There's safe working environment, SDG 8. Safe migration, SDG 10. Deaths from natural disasters and road accidents, SDG 11. Sound management of chemicals, SDG 12. Of course, climate change, SDG 13. Ecosystem protection, SDGs 14 and 15. Violent deaths, SDG 16. There are plenty of handles that 
are integrated into actual work of planning ministries and economics ministries and uh, cross-cabinet uh, groups of prime ministers and the metrics that will be recorded and the advocacy that will come on the basis of the metrics and so on. So there really are lots of handles for our discussion. Okay, sorry. How could these goals actually be achieved in a world of uh, reasonably sound politics? Truly what is most missing now is sound plans around desirable directions. Probably the most exciting development actually is China because in China you have a fifth of the world's population and you have a very remarkable planning machinery and you have a strong commitment by the government to these objectives now. And part of the reason is that they've recognized that the air is poison and that they don't want their own kids to live in this air and there's a public uproar against never seeing the sunshine. And because China decided that they want to be world leaders in sustainable technology. So they're going to, we're all going to drive Chinese electric vehicles in the future. But if you review the Chinese planning right now, it's extensive and deep. And if you review the U.S. planning, there is none. Zero. We don't even have a mechanism for it right now. We don't even have hearings on legislation anymore. It's all done backroom secret. Can we pass it in the next three weeks without a defection of three senators, that kind of thing. It has nothing to do with planning. So we need governments to plan. What kind of plans? Low carbon energy transition is central to half of what we've discussed. That's not conceptually so hard actually but it is trillions of dollars, it's quite involved. It requires very good engineering and it requires a 25 year uh, look forward period. We need a sustainable land use plan basically on where and how food is going to be grown and where water is going to be used and that's uh, what uh, Joachim was just discussing. Uh, of course, other practical steps are that wherever there are poor people, they need help. If they're just left to the market, they suffer, they die, and that's simple. This has really been understood since Jesus it's, uh, and before. We need to mobilize revenues for poor people. The idea that markets will take care of poor people is true they will drive them to extinction. <laughs> there are technical other things to do on how uh, asset flows are managed, channeling domestic saving into sustainable infrastructure. And then there are issues of how to hold governments accountable, which I want to say more about. Uh, how to use the new information technology tools with responsibility, clearly something that's in a huge crisis right now in the United States where our election in 2016 was deeply, deeply compromised by probably Trump working together with the Russians. I don't know if we'll ever know, but it was very deeply compromised by the Russians at least. And uh, we have, of course, nearly $2 trillion of military spending that is an abomination and is the biggest destruction of all that we're doing and is also the, one of the most powerful lobbies, of course, that we, we face. Uh, the Bible gives us lots of uh, good uh, guidance on this. Uh, by the way, I do think Joseph was the first economic advisor in, in history. Uh, he knew that if the future was going to be tough, you save now and you transfer. And this is one of the key lessons uh, that, uh, that, that we need. 
Uh, the Bible teaches us a sabbatical year on land. That's a really good idea. This is what we need to regenerate degraded lands and what we need to save biodiversity is a sabbatical year for land. The Bible instructs us to teach our children diligently and it also says three times, justice, justice, justice shall you pursue, tzedek, 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 tzedek tirdof uh, in Hebrew. Uh, why three times? Because that's the core, if we're going to get to it, is to stop the misdealings. Uh, and that is uh, pretty, pretty fundamental. So how can we accelerate the pace of uh, success? The knowledge communities need to be organized. In this room, we have two or three key knowledge communities. We have the air pollution knowledge community. The world's leaders here. You are a community that knows things that no one else knows. So the rest of us have listened. I will help you to advocate. But this group needs to be organized to speak to those in power directly. Stop killing us with the air pollution. And nobody else can say that but you, authoritatively. So saying it to each other is fascinating, but it will not stop the air pollution. Saying it to, first of all, the head of WHO is crucial. He's not an air pollution specialist, but it's his job to hear you. And then saying it to the World Health Assembly next spring is essential because that's all the world's health ministers coming together and making this a central pillar of non-communicable disease control has to be systematically driven through. So I'm, I don't know of another way other than getting the organized communities properly organized and in the face of the policymakers. And I can tell you, for it's been my experience for 25 years, that is the most crucial gap. We have libraries of knowledge and by the time there's a head of state meeting between two heads of state, it's at best one sentence, usually not on the file card. And so that's where everything drops off, is that we're not transmitting the knowledge effectively into action. And by the way, saying that something's bad is not useful. Saying that something's bad and here's what to do about it is very useful. And again, the other thing about policymakers, first remember they're ignorant. I'm telling you, it's not, it's just a statement of fact. Second is they're busy. So you have to deliver them a plan. Do not leave the planning to your congressman. They don't plan. Do not leave the planning to Mr. Trump. Do not leave the planning to the politicians. It's not their job. Their job is to sell your plan, not to make your plan. That's a huge difference. Second, we need to measure what we're doing in detail and at a quick enough cycle that it counts. So all these air pollution indicators should be out there every three months. We should have a monitoring system. We should have red alerts. We should say the following 10 cities were the most dangerous cities in the world in the last three months because that will get attention span and that will help to keep accountability. Then we have to fight the companies. The companies, the big corporations are absolutely without moral scruples. They're designed to be without moral scruples. There's no accountability right now. We are in a battle with bad companies. If you want the list, I'll give you a list. But we need to take them on. And there are a number of ways to do it. I mentioned uh, several here for divestment public interest lawsuits. I'm trying to get a number started right now. We need consumer boycotts against the worst offenders. 
and there are mechanisms of shareholder resolutions that could play an important role as well. We're in a battle of unrestrained irresponsibility in major companies. And most of the ills that we face are organized structural ills, not unawareness. And on most issues, if you ask the public, do you want your air pollution to come down, they'll say yes by about 90%. But it doesn't mean anything. Getting the companies to stop polluting does mean something. I always like to remind that our 2,000 billionaires in the world have a combined net worth of $8 trillion now, probably even higher given the stock market increase. That's another point of leverage and responsibility. That's it. My, but my point is for us to take the knowledge into action, it's really, it needs a revolution.